So at long last, we're now really ready to start chomping at the bit with the concurrency and parallelism focus, which is really the main point of the class. I'm going to start by giving you an overview of what concurrent programming is. We're not focusing a lot on concurrent programming in this course, but it helps to understand what concurrent programming is in order to be able to compare and contrast it with the main focus of this course, which naturally is parallel programming and parallel processing. I'll first give you an overview of what concurrent programming is, then we'll look at some of the ways in which Java supports concurrent programming, and then we'll switch our attention to the parallelism topics. So we'll start out by talking about what it means to do concurrent programming, and we'll describe the key concepts that underlie the, the approach to concurrency. So a good place to start, really the starting point, this is something you've probably been doing pretty much since you started programming is my guess, is sequential programming. And we need to understand sequential programming in order to be able to compare and contrast it with concurrent programming. So sequential programming is a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. So I like to think of sequential programming in metaphorical or allegorical terms. So imagine going through, say, a drive-through at a fast food restaurant or nowadays almost any place that's serving food. You'll have a drive-through model and the cars line up sequentially and you place your order. And then when you pull up to the pickup window, you get your order and, and everybody goes kind of in a first in, first out uh, discipline, and uh, you go one at a time. So that's one way to think about sequential programming. One of the characteristics of sequential programming is that, that the program's behavior is deterministic. That means it, it's always going to perform the same for a given set of input. So you have a given set of input, a sequential program will always do things in a particular order at a particular time to produce a particular result. So there's not a lot of guesswork going on there. Sequential programs have two characteristics. First, the textual order of statements specifies their order of execution. So if you take a look at this code here, this is a little snippet of code from the get method that's part of Java's ArrayList implementation. You can see the first thing it does is it does a little range check to make sure the index is in bounds. And assuming that the index is in bounds, it goes ahead and it indexes into an array and returns the indexed element in the array. And because the code is sequential and therefore deterministic, the range check method must be called before the element data method. So it always executes kind of from top to bottom, left to right, or something like that. It's the way to think about it, but just another way of saying it's deterministic. And another characteristic is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap. They all go one at a time and one statement doesn't go before the other one. Now, keep in mind that this is the semantics of a sequential program. The actual execution of the code, once it's been converted by a compiler into assembly language and machine code, and then the machine code is going to be uh, run on a processor core, deep down in the bowels of the hardware, instructions can be reordered if it doesn't change the semantics of the output. But the logical behavior of the program is guaranteed to be sequential and guaranteed to be deterministic, and you won't have overlapping execution. Everything goes one at a time. Think of it like dominoes. <laughs> you, you push one and they all kind of fall down in a sequence. So that's sequential programming. I'm obviously not going to spend much more time on that because that's most likely what you've been doing your entire career as a programmer, most likely. And so uh, there's not much more to say about that. So what's concurrent programming? And then how does it compare and contrast to sequential programming? So concurrent programming is a form of computing where threads can run or execute simultaneously. And we'll see that there's a couple of different variants to the meaning simultaneous. It might be physically simultaneous where they actually execute on different cores at the same time. And it might also be logically simultaneous where you have one core and different threads take turns getting a chance to run in a so-called time slicing like manner. So here's an example where we're going to go from i equals zero, i less than s max, and we're gonna go ahead and spawn essentially s max number of threads. 
And as you can see here, we're going to say new thread. We're going to give it a computation, which is a lambda expression in this context. And then we're going to go ahead and start the computation to run and, and do its thing. And each computation will run in a different background thread. So what we're going to have there is we're going to have S max threads. Let's say S max is five, so it can match the, the diagram here where we have the little thread icon. The thread icon is just this little squiggle that looks like a piece of thread with a, an arrow, which denotes a, an instruction pointer executing in that thread. And so a thread is essentially a unit of execution for instruction streams that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores. So down here underneath the, the little round angle, the little gray round angle, we have four processor cores. And the five threads will be multiplexed or mapped onto the underlying processor cores. So that's just an example of spawning a bunch of threads and having them run. Threads can also be multiplexed over one core. If you happen to have a very old computer that only has a single core, then in that particular case, you'll have it, have it, all those threads take turns accessing that one core. Although honestly, this is getting increasingly rare. You have to have a pretty old computer these days to, to not have a multi-core computer. Everybody's selling multi-cores. It's probably almost impossible to buy a new computer these days that has a single core, a single core general purpose computer. You can probably get embedded computers with a single core, but even those are becoming rare because we have so many transistors now, people want to do something with them and so they have more cores. Different executions of a concurrent program may produce different instruction orderings. And this is what we often refer to as non-deterministic. You don't know in advance what the execution order is going to be. Uh, and so one of the consequences of this, which is really important to get your head around because it's at the heart of what makes concurrent programming inherently complex, is that the textual ordering of the source code doesn't necessarily define the order of execution. So if you take a look at the code I show here, where I have three calls to make new threads and start them, and I'm gonna give thread A computation A, and thread B computation B, and thread C computation C. I'm gonna have three different types of computations here. There's no particular guarantee, no particular assurance that computation A runs, between, runs before computation B, which runs before computation C. They can run in, in any old order they feel like, or any old order that the underlying thread scheduler and uh, hardware and other things that do the computations will dictate. So this is what we mean by non-deterministic. We don't know ahead of time what order these operations run in. And they certainly are unlikely to run in the textural order, the order in which we wrote them down in the code. Another thing that happens with, with these approaches is that they can overlap in time. So if we have three computations, computation A, computation B, computation C, their computations can overlap. So they can all be going in parallel, and depending on a whole variety of different factors, there can be overlaps, and some can run slower, some can run faster, depending on, of course, what the, the algorithm's doing, and depending on whether they're accessing different synchronizers at different points along the way in order to coordinate or provide mutually exclusive access to mutable shared state. So this, the, these properties, the fact that the textual order is not defining the order of execution and the fact that the operations can overlap, that leads to all kinds of additional complexities, both inherent and accidental. We typically use concurrent programming to offload work from the user interface thread. That's the thread that's interacting with the user, taking touchscreen events or mouse presses or keyboard strokes or whatever, uh, the, whatever the user is doing to instruct the computer what to do, and then offloading the computations that take a while to run to one or more background threads. So for example, in Android, there's a special designated thread called the user interface thread or the so-called UI thread. And the UI thread is the only thing that can interact with the user. And likewise, anything that takes a while to run, any long running computations, any networking calls, any accesses to databases that may take a while or reading and writing to files that may take a while to, to perform their operations, those things are all offloaded 
from the user interface there to one or more background threads. So you can kind of see it visually here where we've got, say, four background threads, one user interface thread, and all the computations take place in the background thread. One of the characteristics of this model of concurrency, which is very prevalent in platforms like, like Android, platforms like uh, iOS, and just general any kind of GUI platform, graphic user interface platform, is that only the background thread or background threads can block. So they can afford to block, they can afford to wait for something that may take a while like IO or a lock and so on and so forth. Whereas the user interface thread cannot block. The user interface thread will uh, always have to be responsive. And if it blocks for more than just a few short, you know, scores of milliseconds or so on, it'll end up getting some kind of an error. On Android, it comes back as the dreaded application not responding exception. And a little dialogue will pop up and say, this application is not responsive. Do you want to kill it? And so you want to avoid doing that, if at all possible. Having ANR, as they're called, ANR exceptions and ANR dialogues is considered extremely poor form in writing Android apps. So you do not want to do that. So the bottom line is the user interface thread can't block or shouldn't block, background threads can block, and then there needs to be some way to coordinate and interact between the UI thread and the background threads. Now, once you start having more than one thread in your program, uh, some things get easier. So the ability to block becomes easier, but then the potential for problems and corruption and so-called race conditions can start to become problematic. In particular, anytime you have mutable shared state, that's that state that's shared between more than one thread, where the state can be both read from and written to, that has to be protected by synchronizers in order to avoid concurrency hazards, most notably race conditions as well as memory inconsistencies. So that's where the complexity comes from so as, as with most things in life, you get, a, you get a benefit, but then you also have to be responsible for dealing with the consequences of your additional benefits. Uh, for those of you who are Spider-Man fans, this could be summed up by the famous Spider-Man quote. I think it was actually his uncle, Ben, who said this, with great power comes great responsibility. And the same thing is true, of course, for, for concurrency and uh, programming on multi-cores. You've got all this power, but you have to be responsible for using it correctly and wisely. So that's a quick overview of concurrent programming concepts. We're going to dive in a moment into how this is realized in Java, but I just want to make sure that people are comfortable with the overall idea of concurrency before we start looking at the details of how to program it in practice.